So what we can start this next video on is just a, sort of a recap of what we looked at um, at the end of meiosis 1 specifically. So what did we see at the end of meiosis 1? In terms of the chromosome number, we actually made it half. And you can tell very easily that we made it half because we went to haploid. We went to N. We created two haploid cells. And each of those, uh, so what you imagine at the end of meiosis 1 is just looking at one cell. That one cell out of the two that you created is now haploid. And that one cell has only 23 chromosomes. What about number of tetrads? Number of tetrads has actually now gone to zero. So that's very clear because we don't want any more tetrads at the end of meiosis 1. The whole purpose of meiosis 1 was to separate the tetrads after we had crossing over. And then the number of chromatids is now just the double of the number of chromosomes in the individual cell. We now have 46 chromatids because remember, they're still sister chromatids. This chromosome consists of this structure. One sister chromatid here, one sister chromatid here. That gives us 2 times 23 gives us 46 total. So we're just going to erase that just to get some space. This is basically what we see at the end of meiosis 1. Moving forward, we can now continue our discussion on meiosis and now start with the last part of meiosis, which is known as meiosis 2. So meiosis 2 will label this last flowchart. Meiosis 2 is very easy and very simple to understand. Um, all we're doing here, and its overall goal that you should put at the very top, is the separation of sister chromatids. What was our goal for meiosis 1? If you would put the same thing on meiosis 1, it would be the separation of homologous chromosomes, the separation of tetrad. Now we're going to separate the sister chromatids. We start off with, just like we did before, prophase, but this time we call it what? You guessed it, prophase 2. In prophase 2, what we see is the chromosomes partially condense. So we'll write that almost exactly the same as we saw before. We're going to see some very slight differences. Chromos partially condensed because they're now starting to go from chromatin to chromosomes. Because remember, they go back to the chromosome structure after the end of cytokinesis. Um, in addition, we have the spindle apparatus forming. So the spindle apparatus forms. And that's forming in preparation for separating these sister chromatids. Um, in addition, we have now finally in this sort of the difference between prophase 1 and prophase 2 is this. We have no pairing. No pairing of chromosomes. That is the difference between prophase 1 and prophase 2. There is no pairing whatsoever. The cells are haploid. Because the cells are haploid, we do not have the materials necessary to even pair the chromosomes. Because before, what did we do in prophase 1? Or right before, in an interphase, we doubled everything. Are we doubling anything right now? No, we're not. Because the whole goal of meiosis is to separate and to make smaller. We're finally doing that by not pairing any chromosomes. We're just going to leave these individual sister chromatids as individual sister chromatids and make sure that they now get to metaphase 2. So we'll do metaphase 2 right over here. So in metaphase 2, we have what you exactly what you expect. The chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate. So we'll write chromos line up at metaplate. Once they've lined up at the metaphase plate, we're going to have some orientation. But instead of the homologous chromosomes orienting opposite to each other, we're now going to have what opposite? to each other. The sister chromatids will orient opposite to each other. So we'll write SC um, oriented to opposite poles. We write that oriented to opposite poles because again the goal is separation of sister chromatids. In meiosis 1 the goal was separation of homologous chromosomes so you had homologous chromosomes orienting themselves. Now you're having sister chromatids orienting themselves because you want to separate them and then these sister chromatids will attach to the spindles as well. Why are they attaching to the spindles? Well the spindles are microtubules. Why are microtubules important? Microtubules are important because they connect at the kinetochore and then they depolymerize. Get shorter and shorter and shorter as they depolymerize we pull away those sister chromatids uh, from each other. That's what we're, our overall goal is. So we're almost there. So we did prophase 2, metaphase 2. What's next? Next is anaphase 2. And this is going to be sort of that key phase in which we're going to have the separation. So the sister chromatids separate, we'll say. 
And also what we'll write about this separation is that they move to opposite poles. Why are they moving to opposite poles? Because now we have to reform another nuclear envelope at double the level so that we end up with four overall haploid cells. We'll get into that at the very end. So once we move to opposite poles, um, once we're actually at the opposite pole, so let's say once they've moved, now each is an individual chromosome. Now each is an individual chromosome chromosome. An easy way to remember if something is a chromosome or if it's a chromatid is to see whether or not or to literally count the number of centromeres. If you notice that something has an independent centromere, that is a chromosome. This is a chromosome. But if I draw this, this is also a chromosome. This is two chromatids, two sister chromatids right here, but they have one centromere. An easy sort of cheat, cheat sheet way of remembering and figuring out how many chromosomes there are is to count number of centromeres. If you count the number of centromeres, you will almost always, I believe, have the correct number of chromosomes. If you notice and look at NFase 2 in your textbooks and count the number of centromeres, you will notice that you now have individual chromosomes at each pole, at each pole being separated. Again, this was a goal to create individual haploid cells. How many? Four. We'll see how that uh, plays out at the very end. In addition, we have to remember that there's a possibility of non-disjunction at any time we have anaphase. So non-disjunction may occur. We just want to write that down, make sure we understand that. This is something we're going to look back on when we start looking at genetics uh, at sort of a human level, problems or errors that occur in the genetic level. Um, this is, of course, non-disjunction. In this situation will be if the sister chromatids failed to separate. What would be non-disjunction in anaphase 1? That would be if the homologous chromosomes failed to separate. So just notice that difference. And finally, we'll conclude with telophase 2. Telophase 2 is our final step. In telophase 2, we're going to not have condensing, but we're going to have decondensing. So chromos decondense. That's expected because you want them to turn back into what? Chromatin, right? You want to start this cycle all over, so you've got to get to chromatin. The nuclear envelope reforms. So right, nuclear ENV reforms, and uh, we also have cytokinesis. But the key thing I want to talk about in cytokinesis are, is the end result of cytokinesis. The end result is four haploid cells. Actually, I want to write that as haploid because it looks like 4N. That's not what I want. Four unique and individual haploid cells. This was our goal. We have reached our goal. Remember, the goal, when we go all the way back to our introductory to my, introduction to mitosis, was to create four haploid cells. Um, now, an important distinction between them is that they're all, each of them, are ge all genetically different. They are all genetically different to both each other. They are all genetically different both to each other and also to the parent cells of which that they came from. Why is this important? Because this promotes genetic variation. Overall, what we can say about, let's say, the end of meiosis 2 we'll do up here. End M2. Oh, that's M3. We don't want to get to that. It doesn't exist. So at the end of meiosis 2, the number of chromosomes, each of these haploid cells are individual haploid cells that each have 23 chromosomes. I'll let you do the drawings and look at the drawings to see how that ends up happening. Each of them are haploid. How many tetrads do we have now? We, of course, have zero tetrads because we have already established that they don't, are not necessary after meiosis 1. And then how many chromatids? This is an important number that I want you to figure out how we get to. I'll tell you that we actually have zero chromatids now only chromosomes. This is something you can look at in your textbook and sort of confirm with yourself and figure out in terms of why we have zero. So overall, we've completed meiosis. This lecture was devoted entirely to meiosis. We looked at many different aspects of this process. We obviously looked at the steps in the past two or three videos, but we also looked at the idea of sexual life cycles and why they're important and what role meiosis plays, especially in terms of diploid, haploid. Know the difference between those and know what each and where they come from. Also, we looked at the idea of sexual life cycles, and in addition, we looked at the idea of chromosomes, the idea of homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids and karyotyping and somatic cells and gametes. 
Know these distinctions because these are the distinctions that are going to be examined of you. These are going to be asked of you. There are a lot of caveats here. And overall, the last thing I want to talk about is that let's appreciate meiosis for the process that it is. This is a process that gives us variation, that gives us variation. It is something that is absolutely beautiful about the process that it allows for four haploid cells, four genetically different haploid cells that are different from each other and the parents that they came from. It's amazing to think that all the variation and diversity of life is almost entirely um, in sort of debt to the process of meiosis. Meiosis is what causes it. It's something that I really, really like to teach. There are a lot of caveats to it. Make sure you understand the specifics and hopefully you appreciate meiosis at a much greater level.